Hey, Eric Sider here with a long, very long overdue garden tour walkthrough. I started a nonprofit permaculture community group earlier this year, which has been taking up most of my time. I will be doing a video more specifically on that and the strategies and how we can help you start your own. But basically, it's a nonprofit community group. We meet once a month and our mission is to promote community resiliency, food and future security, and help create abundance through permaculture education and demonstration. I was hoping to do a few more garden updates through the summer, but just finally getting around to it now in October 1st, and it's supposed to be 100 degrees today. So I thought we were done with these ridiculous temperatures, but so is the reality of Sacramento, July, was the hottest July on record and most things did not recover. June, everything was looking amazing. July put the smack down and it's led me to change up my focus. I'm doing less annuals and just gonna start filling it out with perennials and fruit trees. I'm still treating this more or less like a rental situation. So I'm not gonna invest money in buying fruit trees and berry bushes and planting them in the ground. What I'm gonna be doing it all from is seeds and cuttings and whatever I can get cheap or free. So it will take longer obviously, but I won't be out the cash that potentially can't get back. And all my high value seed plants and stock and fruit trees will be in fabric pots that can go in the ground at some point if the opportunity arises. All right, so let's see what's happening. The most exciting development is I got my first rack of bananas. So this survived the winter and now we got almost 70 bananas on here and I'm excited that they eventually turn into some tasty fruits. So the biggest issue with bananas is they typically take between 18 to 24 months to fruit. So even though you can grow bananas in climates with a colder winter, if they don't survive the winter, then you're starting over every year. So there are some ways you can protect them to get them through marginal climates. But here in Sacramento, 9A, 9B, depending on the year, we get frost, but rare to get a freeze. Although I will say it does seem trending to warmer. So a lot of people are focusing more on subtropicals and things that are frost sensitive, which is fine, but I would not put a majority of my plants into subtropicals because we can always get a hard freeze and potentially all that work would be wiped out. So I'm all about pushing the limits, but you want to make sure you have food secure that can handle your climate. And granted that can be changing, so you might need to adapt, but here we go. So this is going to be the banana row. So there's a great technique called a banana circle where you let the bananas grow up in one direction around the circle and they keep generating and then you can throw your extra mulch and waste in the middle. Also a great way to utilize your gray water from the washing machine. So that's what most of these bananas have been watered with is laundry water. Uh, I've got some ginger. Obviously comfrey, Peruvian ground cherry. It's kind of like a tropical tomatillo that you can eat raw. One of my new favorite berries and I've been planting those everywhere. Let's see what else. You got some bell peppers, eggplant, bananas. So these were the pups that came off. Pop those in these uh, air pots that root prune and those will be kept in there through the winter and then planted out in the spring. Society garlic, one of my favorite edge plants. This is kind of my wild area. 
and I'm going to be adding in more fruit trees and bushes. So basically this whole th area in here is going to be the food forest for free. Cutting seeds, free plants is how I'm going to establish this area. So at the moment, these were uh, Cherokee purples that produced pretty well. I made the mistake of not saving any seed. This would have been the second year in a row, and I don't think I'm gonna get any more fruit now. I just have lots of vine growth. So that's disappointing. But see what I've planted using the tomato plants as shelter. So I got poisonberry here. Got a mulberry. Basically, this is a little mimosa for the nitrogen fixing. Chop and drop. What else? Got a leucina. Another great nitrogen fixing chop and drop. Got uh, peas that will be growing up for the, the spring. Got just berry cuttings. Basically just anytime I'm pruning anything, I'm just sticking the cuttings in the ground and see what happens. Got a loquat down there. What else? Jacaranda, which is uh, evergreen. Really pretty flowers. Does not fix nitrogen, but it's not critical. You can still chop and drop and use the mulch as nutrients. And let's see, we got a fig here. Obviously it's basil, peas, comfrey, lemon balm, just all things kind of mixed in. And I'm gonna do a much better job of pruning. These just are all kind of going wild and crazy. Normally this shade cloth would be gone by now, but with the 100 degree temperatures sticking around, keeping it until um, just to shelter the new guys. Got a uh, Moringa in a pot. Don't do great in clay soils over the winter. I think they tend to root rot out. So keeping this one in a pot for now. Another Lucina, ashwagandha, bit of herbal medicine there. Here we got uh, pomegranate. So I think that my three bomb proof fruit trees for Sacramento would be figs, mulberries, and pomegranates. You don't have to do much for any of those. And particularly for mulberries and figs, they propagate very easily amongst the forest of cherry tomatoes. Uh, that's another pomegranate. There's a sea berry in the background. Let's see, we got another, another loquat, another mimosa. and just some basil, some volunteer potatoes. So these are still producing. This is the Gardener's Delight cherry tomato. These are definitely getting out of control. Eventually this shade cloth will be replaced by mimosas and lochinas, and I will be cutting them at uh, a little above head height. So in the winter, and then they'll grow back. And basically when I have enough of them and they're mature enough, they'll be providing the shade for the summer. So a great way to use living trees as fertilizer and shade. Let's see, go through here. Got some lemon balm, lantana, lemon verbena, another jacaranda in there. Got a cherry tree. Some asparagus, avocados from seed. So anytime I get an avocado pit, I just either stick it in the ground or stick it in a pot and just to see what happens. It's amazing the adaptability things get when they're grown from seed versus transferred from a pot. We got Jerusalem artichoke in flower, going crazy. This is the first time I'm growing this and it's definitely gonna be one of the things I propagate more, it's a tuber that you eat and it has obviously a huge biomass. So it's got multiple classic permaculture, multiple functions and benefits. This is green leaf amaranth, was trialing it as a 
heat tolerant salad greens. You can eat the leaves raw. It is an annual, but I'm gonna let it seed itself and see if we can just get a reseeded high heat salad green. That's the biggest challenge in Sacramento. It gets so hot in the summer and all you wanna do is have salads with your tomatoes and almost none of the lettuces uh, stick around. So finding greens that can tolerate heat that are actually tasty raw is the new challenge. Just some more uh, nursery stock, some citrus root stock, a couple peppers. Ooh, we got a, looks like a unhappy wisteria. Probably dropped the ball on watering that. Let's see, so this bed is a lot of, this is yakon. This is a root crop that you can, kind of like a jicama, slightly sweet, but you can make a syrup, sugar syrup from it. So this whole bed is full of Peruvian ground cherry, yakon, and lots of avocado seedlings amongst other things. Let's see, here we got there's a little uh, mimosa down there. Avocado, avocado. Now these avocados from seed, they're Haas avocado, which aren't frost hardy. So typically they use the Mexicola variety of avocado as rootstock, which are more hardy. So we'll see if we get any success, but I'm just over stacking this area crazily. So I can always cut out what doesn't work. Let's see another mimosa, avocado. And we got some goji berries mixed in as well for good measure. Obviously comfrey, comfrey everywhere. Just keep adding more comfrey. And here is, this is kind of the wildflower bed. So self-seeding poppies and whatever flowers go to seed just get scattered in this bed. I don't want to put trees in here because I'm just, uh, it's a bit close to the concrete pathway, so I don't really want to cause problems there. But this whole thing is rimmed with the uh, comfrey and society garlic. Yeah, there's, this is a new thing this year, this little, I'm not sure which this insect is, but they're going to town on all my ground cherries. So it's, that's the beauty of diversity is every year conditions change, you have explosions of pests and not pests and things succeed and things don't succeed. So that's why it's important to have a diversity of things that grow. So any one year, one thing doesn't do well, you got three to five things to replace it. Ahi Marchant or Italian Wax Pepper is another name. This is produces really well, frost hardy, basically a frost hardy, mild to spicy pepper. It's mild when it's green and gets increasingly hotter as it turns to red. And make our way over here. Oh, so one thing, one big improvement this year, I finally set up some drip irrigation. We're going away around July 4th because it's basically a war zone here with all the illegal fireworks. So we always get out of town and three days of 100 degree weather needed some irrigation help. So these interesting Irrigation controllers are from uh, Australia. It's a company called Measured Irrigation. They're very low tech. So this unglazed terracotta pot, and it's got a control dripper here, and then inside is a float valve. So there's a magnet at the bottom. So when the water evaporates out of the pot, this float sinks, the magnets connect, and then it turns on the flow. And then it's got a dripper here and you can adjust the dripper. So basically if you want it to run longer, you have it coming out slower and the opposite. And then once there's enough water in there, it disengages from the magnet and turns it off. So the idea is great. Just needs a little refinement on the components, I think. Okay, the chicken tractor on steroids is rocking and rolling. Definitely am overdue on an update on that. It's gone through a few evolutions since the last video. The good news is 
I got the compost tested by the good folks at Perma Pastures Farm and the numbers were off the charts in comparison to Elaine Ingham's BioComplete numbers. So this system is amazing. It's the laziest compost I've ever done and it's just producing incredibly good compost. Also very healthy chickens. And the chicken waterer is going amazing. Obviously it's probably a bit overgrown, but it's the self-cleaning chicken water. So all, any little manure that drops in there gets gobbled up by the plants and organisms and keeps healthy, actually protein rich water. So they're getting extra protein from the compost, little organisms in the water. So they're doing well. I'm actually, so this is coming to the end of the next compost cycle. So there's one pile that's free for the chickens to scratch and one in the cage to process. And the initial fear when I did this system was only having chicken manure and I wasn't going to have enough nitrogen. Now it's completely flipped. I actually, that cage was full like a month ago and now it's reducing down to half and all I'm using is the chicken manure from 10 chickens and a full straw bale. So obviously the biology or activity that's been built up in the past two years is just going crazy. So I think I might almost have enough to do three piles simultaneously until the two. Anyway, good problem to have. Let's see. So my, this year, my trombocinos did not really do anything, but the Jerusalem artichoke is going champion. It's like probably close to 12 feet tall. And these would be a great way to block the afternoon sun. So I'm going to because they're just tall and straight, don't take up much width. So I'm gonna be utilizing these to protect some of the fruit trees. You can also use them as a living trellis to grow beans and peas and other vining crops. And they're just a great biomass. These go through a little electric chipper like butter. So, and then obviously you get the prolific root crop. That's a good carbohydrate. So. I'm definitely enjoying this introduction. So here's a new little feature. So I got a fig tree that I tr was grown for two years, dug it up because I needed to move the chicken pen so I could have more space between the fence. And that sat in shade for a year and mulch and then planted it this past fall and it's recovered amazing. So I got just avocados, just sticking the pits in. You got this fig, got passion fruit growing up the fig, which is going into the chicken. Sorry about the sun. The chicken run. But the most amazing thing is this monster of a mulberry back there. This is less than one year's growth. And that's, I'm saying at least 10, 12 feet. This started as a one foot long cutting, narrower than my index finger, literally stuck it in the ground in January. And uh, I mean, look at the thickness of the stem. And then this is why I love mulberries. This thing is just towering. Obviously I'm gonna prune it back, but it's obviously hugely successful variety so i'll be cutting that back and mulberries and chickens just go together amazingly got some canna lily some agapanthus some calla lily just as flowers and biomass little mimosa down there will come in various ground cherries strawberries new zealand spinach just a whole assortment of stuff did have beans growing up here. Not sure, I might do a run of 
Jerusalem artichokes along here next uh, next spring. We'll see. The calamansi in definitely need of a big prune. I'm going to give it a big haircut. It's just getting way too tall and too much of the fruit is up high where we can't reach it. So I'm just going to give this a big, nice trim. Got some comfrey, a couple avocados from seed, and they got a fig down there. So I just need to pop in a nitrogen fixer or two to round this out because this gets a lot of sun. Although the Jerusalem artichoke is doing some nice shade there. $12 budget pomegranate from Lowe's. This is the second year I've had it and it's producing well. Probably could use a bigger pot. Then we got, so these are all my fruit trees I've paid money for and they're probably gonna stay in the pots and just grow out. This is a fig, goji berry, loquat, from seed. This is a lime tree bay leaf, which if you're not aware, bay leaf grows like crazy here. So you should never have to buy bay leaf for herbs. Uh, passion fruit. Passion fruit grows crazy here as well. And I'm trying this spiraling technique to see if I can have a vine crop in a small space. Setsuma mandarin. Meyer lemon, a rescue avocado, and a rescue citrus. I still don't know what this is. I suspect it's probably a grapefruit, but not sure. Ground cherry, not too happy. Uh, dwarf blackberry, blueberry, not too happy either, not sure why. And adding in a Santa Rosa plum, which is choice plum poisonberry that I use for cuttings, Fajoa, great hardy evergreen fruit tree, another rescue avocado. Here, this is a real disappointment. My perennial chayote vine has not fruited, which I was expecting it to be a bumper crop. Did really well last year, but again, in July, all the vine that was on that side just got cooked. This uh, apple is looking a lot better than it has been. All these fruit trees, we just had weed mats surrounding them for 10 years and just are very stunted and sad. So still introducing compost and biology and they all still need plenty of pruning. Uh, there's a boysenberry hiding back there. And got sweet potato, ground cherry. This was my Butternut squash fence, but again, not didn't not doing too well. Got a black thornless blackberry. So again, just perennializing everything. This is a pear tree that got some kind of, I think the fire blight this year. So again, all these fruit trees, they're not greatest producers and they definitely need shade from the summer. So this is a apple tree. Definitely in need of pruning and whatnot. Pink lemonade blueberry, which I think I left it in the sun and it got cooked and hopefully it's gonna recover. But yeah, the, the sun and the heat in the summer is just volatile as heck. This is a dwarf avocado. It's got a nectarine, which was discounted bare root, I think from Green Acres and seems to be recovering. Looked a little worse for wear at the nursery. Uh, peach, dwarf mulberry. So using a lot of cuttings for this around. And persimmon was, thought we were gonna have a great persimmon harvest, but you can see the, it all got scorched by the sun. So have a mimosa down there. And then I'm gonna do a ring of Jerusalem artichokes here on the southwest to protect this from the sun because this just gets cooked all day and you can see the structure is pretty jacked up so it needs some help all right moving along oh, we got some so this was 
this was from a cutting, had it in a pot and it needed to be repotted. And I said, well, I didn't pay for this golden raspberry. So in the ground it goes and I can use the cuttings for more berry bushes, more ginger, got mints and succulent ground covers, basically living mulch. Works really well in this climate. Got, this was my wild rice pond. Still haven't had much of a harvest from this, so I'm not sure if the experiments failed or we'll give it another year, but it did reseed and germinate and regrow on its own, which I didn't think was gonna happen because usually needs colder temperatures, but then it didn't get much of a harvest, so maybe that's the issue. So we got azola and water hyacinth in there at the moment for sucking up extra nutrients and biomass. This is kind of the junk area, so I don't trust any homesteaders without a junky area. Uh, I got some jujube or Chinese date I'm gonna use for seed. It's a really hardy fruit tree. Not my favorite thing to eat, but anything that grows without much work and produces fruit, I'm all for. Just got some more avocados from seed. This is the natural swimming pool, which it will be doing a video just on this. It's mostly for my dog and it's the filtration is undersized, but I did have all the water hyacinth that's in here was in the pool to suck up extra nutrient. It gets a bit messy, so I probably need Definitely one more of these tubs, if not two or three more to really match the surface area for filtration, but it's really just for the dog and then it captures rainwater in the winter. Going along. Got uh, another passion fruit. We'll be growing up this uh, palm tree this oh here's a so we got this ornamental pear which doesn't do much I mean it does provide some shade so it will be the overstory as the fruit trees grow up but what I'm trialing now is to graft the fruiting pear onto the ornamental pear so if that works, this will become a much more useful tree. Going to give it a big haircut this winter, so I'll have lots of regrowth to graft onto. This is the weedy lawn, which I had trialing some hardy ground covers on that side. They were doing well and then just kind of gave up. I think the last heat spell we had, kind of disappointing, obviously Bermuda grass. We don't, I don't want to water this as much as I would need to, to keep it grass. So what happens is when it rains, it all fills in. And then through the summer it, and my dog running on it, it turns into a dirt patch. So still trying to figure out a low water solution for that. That can also handle a bit of dog traffic. So you can see the Jerusalem artichokes we got this is the root barrier. So we got, uh, there's daffodils and tulips in there. There's daylily, great kind of survival food, root barrier, Jerusalem artichoke, canna lily, some comfrey in there, sweet potato, agapanthus, some strawberry. There's like a random lavender and a couple other things just kind of tucked in there. Anytime I have seed I want to spread around, it kind of gets tossed in there. Here is a grapevine, so that'll be running the length of this wall. And I'll probably chuck in a fig or something in the middle there. Over here, so this area just gets baked by the sun, so it's not much good really for regular veggies in the summer. Again, had uh, cucumbers all looking amazing along here, cucumbers and beans, and then the July heat just smacked those down. But I got 
sugar snap peas all along this hole, like 60 feet of sugar snap peas. So they should be doing well. Got some butterfly sage. This was removed, and again, another tree with weed mat right up to the trunk. So I removed that, put down some compost and this uh, crep myrtle should be growing up. Got a uh, grape cutting here and so that'll climb up and then cover this arbor. This is the avocado, which I have a video about how to grow avocados in clay soils because they don't like their feet wet. So when it's rainy, cold and clay soils over the winter here kills a lot of trees that don't can't handle it. So this is a mixture of landscape rock and compost. And this avocado definitely got scorched. I thought it was gonna have more shade than it did, but right here, right around noon to one is still getting direct sunlight. So it's not the happiest and we'll see. If it doesn't improve, I might just stick a avocado seed in there. And I'm hoping this crepe myrtle grows up and gives it shade for next summer. So these are gonna be, I'm gonna keep these basically for the annual crops. Um, got some tomatoes, peppers, spring onions, zucchini. Again, I thought I was gonna be oversupplied with zucchini, but July killed that. Coming back a little bit, but they're a bit wonky. So since here is gonna be the food forest perennials, I will keep these for the choice annuals. And this is gets blocked by the afternoon sun typically. So should be a good system and just give me less worry about having to do seeds and annuals and all that stuff. Some bamboo, a couple giant running bamboos, which probably desperately need to be potted up. Don't really have a plan for those just yet. Mostly just growing them out for potential uh, plant sales, and again, just garden peas along here. And that's pretty much it. Okay, hope you enjoyed that walkthrough and update. And this was definitely a frustrating year for the garden, but we learn from it and move on. And I'm definitely going to be leaning heavily into perennials and fruit trees with just a few choice annuals. If you're in need of permaculture t-shirts or consultation and design, links for all that will be below, as well as the info on the permaculture community group. You can do a lot remotely these days with technology and sometimes just a half hour video chat is enough to confirm whether you're doing something right or give you some ideas to get started. Okay, thanks so much for watching and I will see you next time.